Maura Murray was born May the 4th, 1982 in Hanson, Massachusetts. The fourth child of Fred and Laura Murray, she had an older brother, Fred, two older sisters, Kathleen and Julie, and a younger brother, Kurt. Maura was raised in an Irish Catholic household. When she was six, her parents divorced, after which Maura lived primarily with her mother. Murray graduated from Whitman Hanson Regional High School, where she was a star athlete on the school's track team. She was accepted into the United States Military Academy in West Point, New York, where she studied chemical engineering for three semesters. After her freshman year, she transferred to the University of Massachusetts to study nursing. In November 2003, three months before her disappearance, Murray admitted to using a stolen credit card to order food from several restaurants. The charge was continued in December to be dismissed after three months' good behaviour. On the evening of February the 5th, 2004, while she was on duty at her campus security job, Murray spoke on the phone with her older sister Kathleen. They discussed Kathleen's relationship with her finance. Around 10.30pm, while still on her shift, Murray reportedly broke down in tears. When her supervisor arrived at her desk, Murray was just completely zoned out, no reaction at all. The supervisor escorted Murray back to her dorm around 1.20am. When she asked what was wrong, Murray said two words, my sister. The contents of this call remained unknown until October 2017, when Kathleen explained the conversation. Kathleen, a recovering alcoholic, had been discharged from a rehabilitation clinic that evening, and on her way home, her finance took her to a liquor store, which caused an emotional breakdown. On Saturday, February the 7th, Murray's father, Fred, arrived in Amherst. He told investigators he and Murray went car shopping that afternoon and later went to dinner with a friend of his daughter. Murray dropped her father off at his motel room and, borrowing his car, returned to campus to attend a dorm party. She arrived at 10.30pm. At 2.30am on Sunday, February the 8th, she left the party. At 3.30am en route to her father's motel, she struck a guardrail on Route 9 in Hadley, causing nearly $10,000 worth of damage to her father's car. The responding officer wrote an accident report but there is no documentation of field sobriety tests being conducted. Murray was driven to her father's motel and stayed in his room the rest of the morning. At 4.49am, there was a cell phone call placed to her boyfriend from Fred's phone. The participants and content of the phone call are unknown. Later, on Sunday morning, Fred Murray learned the damage to his vehicle would be covered by his auto insurance. He rented a car, dropped Murray off at university and departed for Connecticut. At 11.30 that night, Fred called his daughter to remind her to obtain accident forms from the Registry of Motor Vehicles. They agreed to talk again Monday night to discuss the forms and fill out the insurance claim via phone. After midnight on Monday, February the 9th, Murray used her personal computer to search MapQuest for directions to the Berkshires and Burlington, Vermont. The first reported contact Murray had with anyone on February the 9th was at 1pm when she emailed her boyfriend, I love you more. I got your messages, but honestly, I didn't feel like talking to much of anyone. I promise to call today though, love you, Maura. She also made a phone call inquiring about renting a condominium at the same Bartlett New Hampshire Condo Association which her family had vacationed at in the past. 
telephone records indicate the call lasted three minutes. The owner did not rent the condo to Murray. At 1.13pm, Murray called a fellow nursing student for reasons unknown. At 1.24pm, Murray emailed a work supervisor of the nursing school faculty that she would be out of town for a week due to a death in her family. However, no one in her family had died. She also said she would contact them when she returned. At 2.05pm, Murray called a number which provides recorded information about booking hotels. The call lasted approximately five minutes. At 2.18pm, she telephoned her boyfriend and left a voice message promising him they would talk later. In her car, Murray packed clothing, toiletries, college textbooks and birth control pills. When her room would search later, campus police discovered most of her belongings packed in boxes and the art removed from the walls. It is not clear whether Murray packed them that day, but police at the time said she had packed between Sunday night and Monday morning. On top of the boxes was a printed email to Murray's boyfriend, indicating trouble in the relationship. Around 3.30pm, she drove off the campus in her black 1996 Saturn sedan. Classes at the university had been cancelled that day due to a snowstorm. At 3.40pm, Murray withdrew $280 from an ATM. Closed circuit footage showed she was alone. At a nearby liquor store, Murray purchased about $40 worth of alcoholic beverages, including Bailey's Irish Cream, Kahlua, Vodka and a box of wine. Security footage again shows she was alone when she made that purchase. At some point in the day, she also picked up an accident report form from the Massachusetts Registry of Motor Vehicles. Murray then left between 4pm and 5pm, presumably via Interstate 91 North. She called to check her voicemail at 4.37pm, the last recorded use of her cell phone. To date, there is no indication she had informed anyone of her destination or any evidence that she had chosen one. Sometime after 7pm, a Woodsville, New Hampshire resident heard a loud thump outside her house. Through her window, she could see a car up against the snowbank along Route 112. The car pointed west on the eastbound side of the road. She telephoned the Grafton County Sheriff's Department at 7.27pm to report the accident, according to the 911 log. The woman claimed to have seen a man smoking a cigarette inside the car. However, she later stated that she had not seen a man, nor a person, smoking a cigarette but rather had seen what appeared to be a red light glowing from inside the car, potentially from a cell phone. At about the same time, another neighbour saw the car as well as someone walking around the vehicle. She witnessed a third neighbour pull up alongside the vehicle. The neighbour, a school bus driver returning home, noticed the young woman was not bleeding or visibly injured but cold and shivering. He offered to telephone for help, she asked him not to call the police and assured him she had already called AAA. However, AAA has no record of any such call. Knowing there was no cell reception in the area, the bus driver continued home and called the police. His call was received by the Sheriff's Department at 7.43pm. He was unable to see Murray's car while he made the call but did notice several cars pass on the road before the police arrived. Another local resident driving home from work claimed she passed by the scene around 7.37pm and saw a police SUV parked face to face with Murray's car. She pulled over briefly and did not see anyone inside or outside the cars and decided to continue home. This witness's statement contradicts the official police log 
which has the Haverhill Police arriving nine minutes later. According to the official police log, at 7.46pm, a Haverhill Police officer arrived at the scene. No one was inside or around the car. The car had impacted the tree on the driver's side of the vehicle, severely damaging the left headlight and pushing the car's radiator into the fan, rendering it inoperable. The car's windshield was cracked on the driver's side and both airbags had deployed. The car was locked. Inside and outside the car, he discovered red stains that looked to be red wine. Inside the car, the officer found an empty beer bottle and a damaged box of wine on the rear seat. In addition, he found a AAA card issued to Murray, blank accident report forms, gloves, compact discs, makeup, diamond jewellery, driving directions to Burlington, Vermont, Murray's favourite stuffed animal and a book about mountain climbing in the White Mountains. Missing were Murray's debit card, credit cards and cell phone, none of which has been located or used since their disappearance. The police later reported some of the bottles of purchased liquor were also missing. Between 8pm and 8.30pm, a contractor returning home saw a young person moving quickly on foot eastbound on Route 112, about 4 to 5 miles east of where Murray's vehicle was discovered. He noted that the young person was wearing jeans, a dark coat and a light coloured hood. He did not report it to the police immediately due to his own confusion of the dates only discovering three months later when reviewing his work records that he had spotted the young person the same night Murray disappeared. The responding officer and the bus driver drove around the area searching for Murray. Just before 8pm, EMS and a fire truck arrived to clear the scene. By 8.49pm, the car had been towed to a local garage. At about 9.30pm, the responding officer left. On February the 11th, Murray's father arrived before dawn in Haverhill. At 8am, New Hampshire Fish and Game, the Murrays and others began to search. A police dog tracked the scent from one of Murray's gloves a hundred yards east from where the vehicle had been discovered, but lost the scent. This suggested to police she could have left the area in another car. At 5pm, Murray's boyfriend and his parents arrived in Haverhill. He was interrogated in private and then was joined by his parents for questioning. At 7pm, the police said they believed Murray came to the area either to run away or attempt suicide. The family believed this was unlikely. Murray's boyfriend had turned off his cell phone during the flight to Haverhill. At some point, he received a voicemail that he believed was the sound of Murray sobbing. The call was traced to a calling card issued to the American Red Cross. Although missing persons cases are normally handled by local and state police, the FBI joined the investigation 10 days after she disappeared. The Haverhill Police Chief announced that the search was now nationwide. 10 days after her disappearance, New Hampshire Fish and Game conducted a second ground and air search using a helicopter with a thermal imaging camera, tracking dogs and cadaver dogs. Murray's older sister discovered a ripped white pair of women's underwear lying in the snow on a secluded trail near French Pond Road on February the 26th, but DNA tests found that the underwear did not belong to Murray.
The March 2004 disappearance of Brianna Maitland in Montgomery, Vermont, 66 miles away from Murray's last sighting in Woodsville drew comparisons from the media and law enforcement due to the similarities in disappearances. However, state police have stated there are no links between the two cases. In April and again in June, New Hampshire and Vermont police dismissed any connection between Murray's case and Maitland's. In a press release, they stated they believed that Mora was headed for an unknown destination and may have accepted a ride in order to continue to that location, adding that they have discovered no evidence that a crime had been committed. They dismissed the possibility of a serious killer being involved. On July the 1st, police retrieved the items found in Murray's vehicle from her family for forensic analysis. On July the 13th, a one mile radius search was performed by nearly 100 searchers, including state troopers, rescue personnel and volunteers. Police stated the search discovered nothing conclusive. In late 2004, a man allegedly gave Murray's father a rusty stained knife that belonged to the man's brother, who had a criminal past and lived less than a mile from where the car was discovered. His brother and his brother's girlfriend were said to have acted strangely after the disappearance, and the man's brother claimed he believed the knife had been used to kill Murray. Several days after the knife was given to Murray's father, the man's brother allegedly scrapped his Volvo. Family members of the man who had turned in the knife claimed he had made up the story in order to obtain reward money in the investigation and that he had a history of drug abuse. In October 2006, volunteers led a two-day search within a few miles of where Murray's car was found. In the closet of an airframe house approximately one mile from the crash site, cadaver dogs allegedly went bonkers, possibly identifying the presence of human remains. The house had formerly been the residence of the man implicated by his brother who had given Fred Murray the rusty knife in 2004. A sample of the carpet from the home was sent to the New Hampshire State Police but the results were never released to the public. In July 2008, volunteers led another two-day search through wooded areas in Haverhill. The group consisted of dog teams and licensed private investigators. In February 2019, the 15th anniversary of Murray's disappearance, Fred Murray reiterated his belief that his daughter was dead, as well as his suspicions about the nearby house that cadaver dogs responded to. Excavation was done within the basement of the house. Fred Murray had previously wanted to search the home, but the owners did not cooperate. Following the sale of the property, its new owners allowed several searches of the property since February. The excavation conducted in early April found absolutely nothing other than what appears to be a piece of pottery or old piping. In early 2021, the tree at the site where Murray was last seen, which had been marked with a blue ribbon as a memorial, was cut down by the property owner. On September 14th, 2021, a bone fragment was found on Loom Mountain in Lincoln, New Hampshire, about 16 miles off the site of Murray's crash along Route 112. Murray had been to the mountain before and had knowledge of the area, according to her sister. According to a statement, the bone fragments are pretty small and may take anywhere from two to seven months to identify. The area is currently being investigated as of mid-September, with some Loon Mountain workers being questioned in the process. 
In November 2021, however, it was confirmed that those remains are not Murray's.